Hello again, folks. It's been ages. <laughs> well done for those of you who made it. Uh, I did see... Now, Christina said... Uh, was it Anna? Anna said, uh, couldn't find the link on the website. And I'm very glad you said that, Anna. So I'm going to have a double check. Now, the thing to remember about the website... Well, actually, the thing to remember about Home Choir, everybody, is that we've got quite a lot of programmes on the channel, as you might have noticed. Now, as soon as the old live show finishes, the next one pops up. But if you want to look specifically at, for example, deep dives or so on, you want to look at the second page, go to the playlists, and if I look at, uh, for example, Quarantine Chorus, it shows the Morley we've just done. Now, it shows on the playlist for Sacred Sing, it shows the button for Sunday as the current upcoming one. And Deep Dives, it's got that one at the top. So the playlist will always have the next broadcast uh, that is uh, is due in that category. So if you ever get stuck, go to homequire.uk, go to that second page, which you can find from the, from the website. Just scroll down to the bottom. It says, click here to explore. And there it is for you, okay? I'd hate to think anybody was getting lost on our website. It's fantastic to see all of you. Thank you so much. I didn't know if we'd get very many people coming along to a talk on serialism, but I do hope uh, that you enjoy this afternoon session. So for those of you for, who perhaps haven't been along to one of these sessions before, thank you for coming. This, is, uh, this isn't a singing show. This isn't anything to do with performing per se. This is looking into some of the aspects of music uh, that perhaps we've never looked at before it's all very well sort of hearing styles of music but if you don't understand where it's come from or why the composer was thinking that way even why they chose to use those particular notes well then you have no way in to understand and so um and, and a lot of people would find well i don't like that kind of thing and what they mean is generally i don't understand it so therefore it makes me feel uncomfortable so therefore i don't like it so the deep dives everyone are an opportunity i hope uh, to share a little bit of my enthusiasm and passion for music and to increase increase understanding and hopefully your enjoyment of music. Now, today is a little bit of an ask and I'm going to I'm just going to show you why. So I'm just going to bring up my slides. So this is the outline for today and uh, there's a couple of words on this one in particular um, that if you're a classical music aficionado um, will probably want to send you running for the hills and that word is Schoenberg. Uh, and if you've heard the name Schoenberg before, you've probably heard it in the context of, uh, do you like Schoenberg? No, but I stepped in some once. Uh, and that's a direct comment uh, by, by Sir Thomas Beecham, the great composer and conductor. And, um, well... <laughs> I think that's rather mean, and I'm going to explain why today. We're going to look at this particular style of composition that Arnold Schoenberg himself invented called serialism. And for those of you who've been following the composing deep dives, which we're looking at different ways of writing music, starting with just pulling notes out of a hat and choosing from a small number of notes through to using a sequencer, uh, such as uh, Cubase or Logic or Garage Band, um, or last week we were looking at using a score editor. This week, really, you you just need to be able to count to twelve. Okay, and I know that that uh, excludes a lot of people, myself included. As a conductor, I can only count to four or variants of that. Um, but if you can count to twelve, and you can, if you if you've got a logical mind, if you like puzzles like Sudoku, um, if you like crosswords, if you like numbers, then serialism is very much for you. So let me give you a very 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 quick introduction to the situation uh, that uh, out of which serialism emerged, everybody, and that is uh, expressionism. And I'm going to show you a a, a wonderful slide. Here. Here. And you'll see, um, you'll definitely see art on there that you recognise, um, and some that you don't. But really, all of these paintings are, are come under a banner of expressionist. And um, really, music and art and culture and uh, uh, and literature, dance, opera, it's all basically all involved with each other. You you, you really struggle to have one without the other. And as uh, art progressed, music progressed, literature progressed alongside it, and um, if I can now just, I can show you a, a particular chord sequence here. Some of you will recognise this at sight. Some of you recognise it when I play it. Now that is a very, very famous chord sequence. That is the opening to Richard Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. And the, the chord there in red is known as the Tristan chord. And this particular chord sequence, this 
amazing opening to Wagner's just incredible opera, Changed Music Forever. And I'm very quickly going to explain why. I'm not going to spend very long on this because this is just the key that opened the door. But it was the fact that this chord, really in the context of the 19th century, and Wagner was, was a 19th century composer, this chord makes no sense. Shouldn't exist, shouldn't work. And as for this, if Beethoven had heard that, you know, it would have shocked even him. Uh, that this is because this chord is built on a series of unstable, uh, unstable intervals, which then resolves to an instability, and the last uh, note makes it no better. It's still unstable. We don't know where this is leading. And with these chords, with this opening, Wagner, as I said, changed the rules for music. No, no longer were you tied to having to have a very strict tonic and dominant chord structure to your music. You could write pretty much anything as long as it was how you were feeling, and that's the key. That's the key to understanding these styles of music that emerged in the 20th century. If you consider that during the 19th century, we saw a renaissance in emotion in music, uh, and, we, and we take it for granted today that music stirs the soul and we can sit weeping in, in concerts and, and we, can, we can express ourselves in writing, you know, in, in comments uh, on YouTube as we're listening and singing along. This is amazing. I'm crying my eyes out. But, of course, in the early 19th century and around the time of Beethoven and, and uh, even Schubert, that kind of thing was very much... Uh, uh, it was sneered at. The idea that you would pour your heart and soul out uh, through music was was really not the done thing. And when young Schubert was writing his song cycles, De Schöne Müllerin, for example, and Winterheiser, they were scorned and spurned by the uh, by his his uh, uh, his elders and betters. And so the 19th century saw emotion being infused into music. And that's why we have these incredible, uh, wonderful works by Mahler and by Bruckner and by Brahms, you know, these huge symphonies that take emotion and they show it up on a big, big, big screen, a huge canvas, effectively. What we see when we go into the 20th century, though, is, well, a lot of, a lot of music had been written, a lot of words had been said, a lot of pictures had been painted. And so what you're left with at the start of, of the 20th century is a lot of stuff had already been done. And what do you do, particularly when Wagner has just blown up your chord structures and blown up all the rules? Well, what do you do? Well, what the composers of the 20th century did, and here's a very, very brief little timeline of the 20th century, and it's ridiculously compressed. It's very much looking only at uh, what we would call art music. So it's not doesn't include film music, doesn't include jazz or pop or blues or anything else that happened in the 20th century. This is just the what we would think what developed from classical music. What we saw was the, the emergence of styles such as Impressionism, so if you think about uh, in, in art, you know, the Impressionist masters, which used little dots of colour to suggest images. Well, composers like Debussy uh, wrote in that style in his Prélude de l'après-midi d'enfant, which is absolutely wonderful. It's the musical equivalent of one of those pointillist paintings. But you then saw this emergence in uh, after the Great War, after the First World War, um, you saw the emergence of Expressionism, atonality and serialism. What these are, ladies and gentlemen, what these styles of music are, is what we think of as super romantic. And I know some of you out there thinking, well, I like the sound of super romantic. You know, my, my partner treated me to a particularly nice dinner, it was super romantic. Um, but in terms of art, what we're talking about here is taking everything to their extremes. If you consider that Wagner made the ultimate operatic statement with his ring cycle, and some would say he absolutely did, um, well, what do you do if you are a composer who's coming along 40 years after Wagner? What do you write? He's already said everything that can be said, or has he? The idea is that you take those emotional states that these composers were taking us to, you know, the heights of bliss, the depths of agony, and you go further. You, take, you, you, you strip out all of the extraneous stuff. You take one emotion and you push it to its, its limits. It's the equivalent of somebody laughing and then laughing and then laughing and then laughing. After a while, it stops being funny and just starts to be disturbing. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't be explored. And that's, I think, at the heart of, uh, of these early 20th century compo uh, composers, particularly the Expressionists. What you find in Expressionist music, because they were really pushing the envelope, they were trying to find what happens if we take this emotion and we turn it all the way up to 11. It doesn't matter whether people like it or not. 
What does it sound like? What do we get? So you end up with a high level of dissonance. Okay, dissonance, dissonance, sound against sound. You know, this clashes notes that previously would have just sounded like somebody cleaning the keyboard. You get extreme contrast of dynamics. Bear in mind the Romantic era introduced, you know, in really intricate and beautifully created dy dynamics. Well, here you're looking at like hammer blows, suddenly loud, suddenly quiet. So it's sort of... That sort of thing. Big, big, big noises. Constantly changing textures, distorted melodies, angular melodies with wide leaps, extremes of pitches, basically all the rules out the window. That is at the core of expressionism. Now, out of that emerged a hero, <laughs> if you like, and this is Arnold Schoenberg. Now, um, I've seen already in the comments, I think Albert has said, wh where is Alban Berg? Now, Berg was a student of Schoenberg. Okay, as was Webern, uh, and there were many, many other very important composers. But Schoenberg is very important because he was originally a romantic composer. And uh, if you've already always thought that, oh, Schoenberg's music, I can't stand it, listen to some of his early works because he wrote in a romantic style. If you listen to one of his pieces called Transfigured Night, it's absolutely beautiful. It's played on Classic FM quite a lot here in the UK. And when it's finished, it was just, and that was by Schoenberg. And they always get someone who say, I had no idea he'd written anything as nice. But what, what happened is as... Uh, as he developed as a composer, his music, uh, given that he was writing, it was in his prime, really, in this in this period after the First World War, going into the 1930s and 1940s, where um, the the romantic sound of, of, of music was was fracturing, uh, as the world itself was was politically was fracturing, and so um, Schoenberg's first compositions, although they were romantic and they were they were very lovely, he started to move away from that, and they became increasingly dissonant and increasingly increasingly chromatic, so it started to use more than a few semitones and so on. And what we what we started to see, as, along with composers such as Stravinsky, whose Rite of Spring uh, uh, sparked a riot when it was first performed, it was so alien and so stark to people, um, Schoenberg's music was similarly difficult to understand. In fact, there was so much unrest at one of his concerts that the police were called. And if you just stop and think about that for a minute, you know, this is a work that uh, this is a composer whose work is played these days on on you know major major radio stations and all around the world. At one of his premieres, they had to call the cops because people were were so disturbed by his music because they didn't understand it. Now, um, with that in mind, let's have a little look at the kind of thing that he came up with. Before we do that, though, folks, I need to just show you. And at this point, uh, I just need to grab a picture from earlier on. So I thought I had this set up, but it's managed to disappear. So what we need to think about, ladies and gentlemen, is we need to bear in mind that when you're writing a piece of music, you usually choose a key, you choose a scale, um, and you will basically use a series of notes to help you write that piece. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a keyboard image on the screen to give us a little visual. A uh, little visual. There we go. Right. And I'm actually going to take the C off the top because that's not going to help us. OK, now, if we look at this representation of the musical keyboard and there's other ways to look at it, you could look at it on the stave, but this is nice and visual. If we count the number of notes that we can see here on the slide, well, my question to you is how many notes can you see? How many different notes are there? Now, some of you will be saying, well, you're just going to count the names. If you do that, you're going to be uh, you're going to be scuppered. What you're looking for is how many different keys are there? So we've got a C here. C. Now we've got a C sharp or a D flat. That still counts as only one. D, E flat or D sharp, E, F, uh, F sharp or G flat, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, and B. 12. Okay, there are 12 semitones in the scale. What comes after B? We'll see again. So let's listen to it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There we go. And what Schoenberg, uh, the, the theory that Schoenberg came up with was, well... If we always use this, um, if we use the same scale to write, well, we're going to end up with the same music. So he came up with this idea of taking these 12 tones, these 12 notes, and coming up with what was called a tone row. And the idea of a tone row, as you can see here from an example, and this is taken from his Suite Opus 25, 
Uh, and the guitar is, uh, tab is written out here for those who want to play along on your guitar. This is a tone row written by Schoenberg. And what this is, is a representation of the 12 tones of the chromatic scale played one at a time, once each. And this is the order of his tone row. So here it is. Okay, so that is the order of his tone row. Now, what you can then do with a tone row is you can use that to inform your composing. So here's an example. If I just show you here, I'm not going to play this out loud, but you can see the, the numbers underneath the notes correspond to a tone row. So he's actually decided across three instruments. So there's the first, second, third note of the tone row, four, five, six, and so on, whilst there are other notes playing underneath. And so it becomes less of a play a nice chord, that sounds nice, that sounds nice. It becomes more of a mathematical exercise. Uh, this note is next in the tone row, so this must be the pitch. And at this point, those of you who are, um, who've never composed before will be thinking, actually, isn't that cheating? Well, it's, it's a method of composing. You don't need to hear any of it. In fact, the hearing of it is almost a byproduct. The most important thing is to find out, well, if I write this tone row, what then comes out of it? Now, you might think, well, that's, that's all very well, but 12, 12 semitones is not enough to create a piece of music. Well, depends on what you do with it. So one of the techniques he developed was, well, if we're going to have a tone row, uh, what would happen if we played that tone row backwards? So if we take this tone row, we play it backwards we get and that has a particular name that is called the retrograde because it's played backwards and in fact what I'm going to show you is a particularly nice tone row uh, and this is a bit of Webern and so what we have at the top here is we have the PG which is the prime okay that is your main tone row and this again the, the theory is the same with all of these it's the 12 semitones between C and B, and you put them in an order. And once you put them in an order, that's your tone row. So the first one, PG. Okay, then underneath it, we've got the retrograde, which is backwards. And if you look at the numbers underneath, you can see instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it goes 12, 11, 10. So let's play it backwards. Okay, then below that, this is where things start to get really interesting, we have an inversion. Okay, now some of you, your eyes are going to start spinning at this. Please don't worry about it, but, but have a listen anyway. So in this prime row, we start on a note and we drop down a minor third. And then we drop down a semitone. Okay, on the inversion, we go up a minor third and then we go up a semitone. So what we have is the same shape but upside down and because it's that, it'll still contain all 12 pitches. It sounds like this. This is the inversion. And then, of course, you can then have a retrograde inversion. And you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, but it doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't have any melodic shape. Well, no, it doesn't in the, in the kind of conventional sense of composing a melody that's designed to evoke an emotional response. But, but, there is absolute beauty in serialism, particularly uh, if you're not trying to write a particularly romantic or particularly lovely piece of music. What you'll find is uh, if you've ever seen uh, a, 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 a thriller or a horror movie or any kind of film or TV show where there's been any unease required and the music needs to reflect that, folks, well, you'll find that the composer will usually use some kind of serialist technique to create that sort of alien... Um, I don't want to say inhuman, because it is, an, it is a human uh, creative process, but it doesn't start with your ears. It doesn't start with that feeling of, I want to create something that people will like. It comes from a, I want to know what happens when I take this series of notes and, and work with it. OK, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a go, and we're going to take this tone row, because it's a, it's a good one, and, uh, and we're going to have a little play with it. And so what we're going to do, we're going to bring up our trusty sequencer 
And I could have done this on Muse Score. And if you are, uh, if you were here last week and you watched the session on Muse Score and that wonderful scoring program, I could absolutely do that. I've decided to use the sequencer here just because we get to cover all sorts of different visual aspects. You can see it as, as score, but you can also very quickly put down some music. So what we're going to do, everyone, is using this tone row, we're going to write a piece. I've got about five minutes. So let's see what we can come up with, folks. How is everyone doing? Ah, now people are saying, I think it sounds like a horror movie soundtrack. Let's see what you think when we're finished. Um, so what we're going to do, first of all, I've got a Bosendorfer piano. You deserve the best, folks. So here's our Bosendorfer. OK, and that's the last time you're going to hear a, a consonant chord. So what we're going to do, first of all, so we've got our tone row, and I've got it up here on the screen, um, but we can see it here. So what I'm going to do, everyone, is I'm going to just play. Uh, I'm going to play those notes in at one note per beat. So I'm going to set it up to 60 beats per minute. That's one per second for those keeping count. And I'm going to play each of those notes one per beat. So here we go. Here's my little click. And. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. OK, so we can see our notes here. And remember, because this is a sequence, so I can click on it. I can see those notes down here below in their sort of block form. If I've made any mistakes, I can drag them round. I can even look at it on the score and just make sure that those are the notes. And that's great. Now, a little thing which I didn't teach you uh, last time we were looking at this is to use something called quantizing. And this is just a little tip to those of you who have been playing around with GarageBand. What you do here is you, uh, you select your notes. You can just do that by clicking on this block here. And then, oops, excuse me. And then this function at the side, quantize, this just allows you to make sure everything you play is exactly in time. So I'm going to say we want to set that up to a one quarter note, which is a crotchet. And there we go. I don't know if you saw that. I'll undo that and do it again. Just watch these little blocks as I go quantize. And these sort of go clunk. And now they are absolutely in time. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to loop that over and over again. So that just plays. I've got 12 notes, which is three bars, three lots of four. OK, so just to check that, here is our first. This is just the tone row. And you can hear it's absolutely on point. Great. OK, good. So that's not it. That's just the tone row. So let's have another track underneath. We'll just have a nice piano there. Um, oh, I'll have a Steinway for our second one. Gosh, I'm... I'm spoiling you today. Now let's have a look at our, our rows. Well, we've got we could use the same row, but I feel like using the uh, the inversion, okay? Because the, both of them start on a G, and that means that first note will be uh, that there'll be a little bit of consonants before it then diverges. So let's take that, but instead of playing it, boom, boom, just all on the beat, let's do something with that. So we're going to take this, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first two notes here, the G and the B flat, I'm just going to alternate between them and then in the next bar, I'm gonna take the next two notes and then the next one and just create a bit of, a bit of movement, a bit of color, a bit of tension in the sound. This is heading towards that horror movie sound. So that's what we're gonna do. Let's have a bit of a record. Here we go. And. So that was that. Now I'm going to go through and just quantize again. I did see somebody saying, wish I could quantize my online choir recordings. You can if you have this program. Um, maybe that's something I should talk about in a future session. Using a sequencer to enhance your online recording. OK, I shall bear that in mind for a, a future deep dive or series. Now this one, just on quantizing, for those of you who are interested, this needs to be really, really precise. So if I set this to one course in it, watch what happens puts them all on the beat. We don't want that because there were four to a beat. So if I say one eight, still not quite right. I want one sixteen to get it just spot on. There we are. OK, because one four is a crotchet one beat. The one eight is a half beat note. That's quavers and one sixteen is semi quavers. So now let's have a listen. Sounds a bit like Philip Glass. 
Okay, I'm going to loop that as well. So, so far we've got two, two sort of sounds in the middle. I want something bassy, so I'm going to just duplicate that track. So I've got another piano. And let's just have a look. And notice all of this is just coming from it's just coming from this tone row. Once you've got the tone row, you just decide, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and see what it sounds like. Experimentation is the key with uh, with composing. So I think, as before, I think I'm going to take the prime here, uh, and I'm going to play these notes. But I think what I'm going to do is, because these are bass notes, you don't want bass notes moving very quickly. You want high-pitched notes moving quickly, you don't want bass notes moving slowly. In the same way, you know, mice scurry and elephants take a bit longer to move because they're bigger. So let's take that prime row, and I'm going to play that uh, down in the bass, but I'm going to play that um, once every two beats. So it's going to be a big sort of... something like that. OK, so let's record that in. Let's see what that sounds like. Two, off we go. Okay. And once again, I'll quantize that very quickly. And I'll just put it to the nearest crotchet. OK, loop that. So we have three parts. Now, of course, we, we could just say, well, that's it. But it's, it's a little bit on the drab side. It's all piano sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pan that a little bit, first of all. And this top line here this melody, if you like. Let's give it to something a little bit more interesting. So let's give it to a nice flute. Let's, let's put a flute part in at the top. Now, the problem with the flute playing at this pitch, listen. Flutes don't sound so great below the, the stave. You want flutes up nice and high. So let's put this up now. This is where things get nice and interesting for those of you, again, who are interested in, in garage band or garage band. It's down here, we've got a transpose button. And if you've recorded in using the green tracks, I can then drag this up by 12. And we know that there's 12 in an octave. That's now one octave higher. So now it sounds like this. Beautiful. OK, now whilst we're at it, this this bass part on the piano, I feel we should have something a little bit more threatening for our, our horror movie. So let's go for some strings. Let's have a nice arco string ensemble. Arco, by the way, if you've ever seen that word, it means to play with the bow as opposed to pizzicato, which is to pluck. And um, what we'll do is we'll have a bit of reverb. I'm going to go into my space designer here and go into the quarantine choir hall, which I built for us to sing in. And so here, ladies and gentlemen, and I haven't heard this, I hope it's all right, uh, is our composition based entirely on these tone rows. So we, we played this in, I then did a little alternating figure with these, and then I played this tone row in at uh, half time again. I've changed some instruments, and what do you think? Well, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. It's not going to set the world on fire, but it certainly sounds like a piece of music. And there were moments in there you think, actually, that's a nice chord. And it's it's stuff like that that, as a composer, you 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 want those little moments to happen. Those chords. You think I I, I hate ninety five percent of that, but that chord, I'm having that for my next piece. Or I really like the the the, uh, the relationship between the flute and the bass. I'm going to keep that, change that, and then you just tweak and you move things around. You can see with a program like this or with MuseScore, you have the option to sort of pick things up. Now that could be the start of a big orchestral piece and I could bring all of those fantastic tone rows to bear. I could bring in other instruments. It, it's just a matter of making those decisions right at the start. Which notes am I going to use? Now, if you remember the first composing uh, session we did, we used a very small number of notes. We used D, F, G, A, and C. We used a pentatonic scale, five notes, and from that we produced a little piece. Here we've used all 12 tones and we've produced a piece. It might not sound the way you'd necessarily think it, it would, or hope it would sound, but it definitely sounds like music. So what I'm saying is those of you out there who are thinking, well, I've always wanted to compose, have a go. Write a tone row. Why not? 
Why not? Write a little piece. Who says it's all got to sound like, you know, it all has to sound consonant. It all has to sound lovely. Uh, one of the things that these composers were doing, this fantastic chap here and all of his uh, all of his peers and even Wagner, they were looking to break those chains. They were looking to break those rules that have held us to that sounds nice and that doesn't. Therefore, this is good and that is not absolute bunk. And all of these composers and all these great, great artists who, uh, who, who were there, these great super romantics and who produced works like this. Well, I'm sure they would want us to think beyond those narrow, narrow restraints. So I hope that's been of interest to you today, ladies and gentlemen. If you like this style, well, then I really would urge you, have a listen to some of the music of Schoenberg. Listen to Transfigured Night, OK? It is genuinely beautiful, and you can say to people, there's a piece of Schoenberg I really like, all right? And next time you hear a piece of atonal music, just remember, it wasn't composed to make you feel happy. It wasn't composed to make you smile. It was composed because the composer wanted to see what happened when they took a particular set of rules and then applied all their training to it. Who knows? <laughs> Somewhere out there watching right now might be the next great composer of film music. You never know. Well, everybody, thank you so much for coming along today. Next week, more composing. Um, and we'll be looking next week at minimalist techniques. So we'll be looking at the kind of thing that makes the sound of, uh, well, the, the, the dear Philip Glass that might have written. at how to write a chord sequence like that and how to make your own little minimalist piece. So uh, lots to look forward to, but otherwise I'll see you on Friday. Don't forget, two broadcasts, one good, one not so good. And uh, I know which one I'm looking forward to the most. See you, folks. Have a good day. All the best. Bye-bye.